which uh, has been online now uh, for three months. And uh, I think uh, I'm very happy that a lot of us has, have stayed from the very beginning um, through all our Thursday talks and watching my hair go long, grow longer. <laughs> and uh, I am uh, very, very happy indeed, uh, very, very privileged to have uh, uh, Professor Gautam Menon with us today um, to talk about, to take our mind off astronomy and cosmology if we needed to, <laughs> to something that we should pay our attention to more often as if we are not. And that is uh, talk about COVID-19 uh, from uh, an epidemiologist, uh, a biologist uh, and a mathematical biologist point of view. Uh, professor Menon, as you know, um, is currently at Otsuka University, uh, a professor of mathematics and biology, physics and biology there. And, uh, and he's also at the Institute of Mathematical Sciences um, in the theoretical physics and computational biology groups, a computational biology group he set up there. Um, he's also an adjunct professor at TIFR. Um, um, professor Menon was uh, you know, uh, graduated from um, IIT Kanpur, then was a PhD student at ISC, and, uh, and various postdoctoral stints at TIFR and then uh, in Simon Fraser in Vancouver. And then since then, uh, He's been at the Institute of Mathematical Sciences for a long time, and we've known him from his work from IMSC. And in his new role at Ashoka University, he's now uh, shaping very young minds. But he's also been, in the last few uh, months, been very active in the statistical and mathematical analysis of, of this current pandemic. And uh, we are all waiting to see what he says about what will happen. <laughs> Over to you, Gautam. Thank you for that nice introduction, Shama. Can you, I, I take it that you can all hear me and you can see my screen? Yes, perfect. Okay, all right. So what I wanted to tell you about today is a guess for what might unfold in the coming weeks to months regarding COVID. And to do that, I'll have to tell you a little bit about epidemics and pandemics in general to get the, the, the building blocks in place for this discussion. So let me move to this. This is two pictures. The one on the left is a picture of the Delhi Gurugram border on December 19th. And this is really hell on earth. You can just look at the traffic out there. And the picture to the right is the same area in general on the 13th of May, right in the middle of, of, of the first lockdown. So it's, it's nice to be breathing cleaner air and to hear the birds singing instead of just the sounds of traffic. But we should remember that we're somewhat privileged in this, I guess, certainly me and I guess most of you, that. Um, we haven't undergone what a substantial fraction of our population has undergone. The, the large groups of people who are living and working in cities and, and, and states other than their normal place of origin, who had to move back over the past few weeks to months. And the sort of deprivation and difficulties that they've undergone have really shaped the way we think about COVID-19 in India and the larger social impacts of this. So this is, we should remember that thinking about pandemics and thinking about infectious diseases on this scale has many components to it. It has social components, economic components, as well as components that have to do with epidemiology, with biology, with medicine, et cetera, et cetera. So this is really, I tend to think of diseases as a place where many, many different areas of work intersect together. So I want to tell you about a disease whose official name is COVID-19. It's caused by a virus, in this case, a coronavirus. The official name of the virus is SARS-CoV-2. And the earlier virus that caused SARS initially in the early 2000s, SARS-CoV-1, that's the terminology that we'll use. And sometimes just for sort of uh, simplicity, I'll refer to this as the coronavirus, although it does have a specific name, which is SARS-CoV-2. A pandemic is a global disease epidemic. It covers multiple countries in the world. An example of a pandemic is HIV AIDS. This is certainly the major, exa major example of the last 50 to 60 years in our knowledge. Spanish flu is another example that you may not have heard of, at least some of you may not have heard of, that really was the defining pandemic event of the last 120 years, roughly 100 years odd, until COVID-19 came along. Hollywood seems to like uh, movies around pandemics. So Contagion is a nice movie. I can recommend it to you if you haven't seen it already. It's the tagline is nothing spreads like fear. It does a lot of the basic clinical, biological, epidemiological stuff, right? So it's worth seeing for that reason. It is the only movie which actually has a formula for the reproductive ratio written on as part of the movie. So that's another reason why you should see it. A movie called Virus was made recently. This is a Malayalam movie, which apparently also is very good, although I haven't had the chance to see it yet. So this is Spanish flu. 
It's a type of influenza, and it struck the world between January 1918 and December 1919. And over here in this picture, you can see a ward, large numbers of people together, all suffering from the disease. And in a sense, as I said, this is 1918, 1919 is around 101, 102 years ago. And as I said, this is the defining epidemic, defining pandemic of the last century odd. I said it was defining because it infected 500 million people, which is about 25% of the world population at that time. And of them, somewhere between 30 and 50 million died. What's a little less known is that this pandemic hit India the hardest among all of the countries, in the countries of Europe, countries in, in, in the US was another, was another country where it really struck. About 15 to 20 million people died in India alone. And that was about five to 10% of our population at that time. So it's a situation in which roughly one in 10 people in the country died, somewhere between one in 10 or one in 20 died in that country. And there's been now an increasing realization of the fact that there was a history behind this pandemic that we really should understand more of. It is very well documented, or at least we weren't very concerned about maintaining the documentation from that time on, but people have now begun to go back to it, to go back and look at old city records, urban records, et cetera, especially in Bangalore and other cities, to try to find out what it is, that, how did this actually impact the nation at that point? The 1918-1990 Spanish flu killed around 2.5% of its victim, and this is unusual for a flu. This is like a canonical influenza. It's the same type of, 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 of virus that causes, for example, H1N1. It's unusual for several reasons. First of all, the number is large. It also disproportionately killed people in the age group of about 18 to 40 years. This is unusual because influenza usually kills older people. It has some effect on younger people as well. But because medical care was somewhat more primitive then, we, didn't, we had no idea how to treat these, these people. We had no idea what measures ought to be taken to protect people from each other in the context of a fast spreading disease of this form. There were many deaths at that point. Also, people were just emerging from the shadow of the First World War. Their, their immune systems in almost all cases were shot to pieces. They had suffered years of deprivation, malnutrition. So all of this added up to, to give such a disproportionately large number of, of victims of the disease. Here's a timeline of this particular century and of the major disease events associated with infectious disease that have happened in this century, post-2000. SARS is certainly something that, that, that happened in, in yours and my lifetime, 2002 to 2003. Very, very important event in terms of disease in the whole of, of South, South Asia, Southeast Asia. H1N1 came along in 2009, related to Spanish flu. So this is like the original Spanish flu of, of, of 1918, 1919. MERS is a disease you may have heard a little less of. It's a little less, less well known. That's in 2012 onward. There's still outbreaks of MERS, but luckily confined to Saudi Arabia and the countries around it. Ebola has been with us for a long time, since 1976. This constantly recurs in, in regions, mainly around Central to West Africa. So 1976, 2013, there is an ongoing epidemic of Ebola, but luckily it's still geographically contained at this point. You're not seeing a pandemic version. There's a local epidemic version or local outbreak version, really, not even truly an epidemic in localized regions, but nothing approaching the scale of SARS-CoV-2. So the current disease that we're all confronting is COVID-19 caused by the virus SARS-CoV-2. This is 2019 onwards. We're not very sure when we will emerge from the shadow of, of COVID-19. The arrow, as you will notice, keeps going on. And that really is a reflection of the fact that people never get rid of infectious diseases. They're a part of humankind. They're a part of everything that shapes our own natural history. So we should be prepared for more diseases like this in the future. But now, hopefully, the next time around, hopefully, we'll be a little better prepared to deal with them. SARS, MERS, and COVID-19, I'll just go back and show you these. The SARS, MERS, and COVID-19 and COVID are all in the same color. And that's because they're all caused by the same type of virus, a coronavirus. It's called a coronavirus because of its very characteristic crown-like shape. All of these diseases lack any treatment of vaccines currently. There was a spurt of activity in the development of vaccines around the time that SARS hit us, but then SARS went away within about within a year. And after that, interest rapidly declined in developing a vaccine, which is a pity because given had we worked more on coronavirus vaccines at that point, we would presumably have understood a little better in, and been in a little better shape to look at vaccines for the current pandemic of COVID-19. So let me tell you a little bit about the timeline of COVID-19. In December, on December 31st, 2019, the World Health Organization was informed by Chinese authorities in the city of Wuhan 
of an outbreak of pneumonia of unknown cause in Wuhan. Wuhan is the seventh largest city in China with 11 million residents. So it's already bigger than Bangalore, bigger than Chennai, bigger than Hyderabad, bigger than certainly than Pune. And it's kind of on the scale of Bombay, Delhi, Calcutta, et cetera, et cetera. So it's a large city, a large Chinese city, very important for trade, very important for manufacturing. And there are a lot of links between Wuhan and India, for example, because Wuhan is such a major center for manufacturing. Already by the 31st of December, when they reported this, hospitals in Wuhan had been seeing cases that looked like pneumonia pretty much throughout December 2019. Finally, they examined the cause of this pneumonia. Pneumonia is, is conventionally a bacterial disease, and you should be able to find the, the cause for this fairly fast. But they could find no bacteria associated with the pneumonia. This was finally diagnosed as a viral pneumonia. But then the question arose, which virus was responsible for this? It was also noticed at that time that many of the patients had some contact with a seafood wholesale market in the center of the city. When I say many, I mean, initially it was, it was said almost all of them did, but when you went, went back and looked at the numbers, it turned out that the number was about 45 to 50%. So it wasn't a completely unambiguous association of all people who fell in with COVID-19 with that particular market. But nevertheless, there was some sense that maybe this might have been the epicenter from which the disease spread outwards. The seafood market was closed on the 1st of January. WHO, remember, was informed on the 31st of December. By the 11th of January, the first death happened. By the 10th of January, the first novel virus genome was sequenced. It had been identified as a novel virus, a coronavirus, by about the 3rd or the 4th of January. By the 10th, it had been completely sequenced. So that's some illustration of the speed to which, to which scientific activity works nowadays. This would have been unimaginable. 10 years ago, 20 years ago, that such a short time would elapse between the discovery of a new disease and the discovery of the agent that actually caused that disease. By the 23rd of January, Wuhan had shut down completely. By the 30th of January, the World Health Organization, this was their third meeting, they finally decided to call it a public health emergency of international concern or a PHEIC, sometimes just called a FEEC. They had already had two meetings before that in which they couldn't quite decide whether, to, whether this merited that level of seriousness. But by the January 30th, they had decided that this is the ultimate class, the highest level of alertness. The, the declaration of the FIC was made then. By the 30th of January, India saw its first Indian case, a girl, who, girl doctor, woman doctor who would come back from Wuhan. And by the 3rd of February, two other doctors who would come back with her again for the holiday were also diagnosed as being positive. By the 4th of March, we began, India began to compulsorily screen all international passengers to India. By about the 15th of February, any traffic from, from, from China was already being screened at that point. So we were, our preparations were set in place, except that screening of the more rigorous screening really happened only by March. This was a somewhat simpler screening that happened by, by that, happened, that was happening throughout the whole of February. Bacteria and viruses move between people in multiple ways. So one way of direct contact, for example, through a handshake in which bacterial viruses that you get when you wipe your hands across your face or transfer your mucus onto your hand is transferred to someone else when they shake your hand. Indirect contact is when you touch something and someone else lately, later comes and touches the same thing. This is called, con this is called transferring of the disease, a fomite, that's a technical term for it. Droplets is when someone sneezes and someone in your vicinity, when if you sneeze and someone in your vicinity manages to in inhale at the same time then they will ingest droplets that you have been emitting. And this is direct ingestion of droplets. And that's one way in which you can transfer the disease. And this is believed currently to be the dominant way in which COVID-19 passes from person to person. The airborne route is like the droplet route, the direct droplet route, except that it can be time delayed. So someone can walk by a few minutes later and then ingest the same droplets because these droplets take time to fall down. From, from, their, from being suspended in there, because they typically, although they have a whole range of sizes, there are small and big ones, the smaller ones do take a fair amount of time before they begin to settle down. Some diseases come to us from animals. For example, bats are a major source of disease, and COVID-19 is supposed to have come to us from bats through some intermediate animal, in this case, probably some exotic animal that was in the market at the same time. Poultry is a source of, another no of other novel viruses, for example, H1N1. These, are, these animals are natural hosts for these viruses. And the event by which something crosses over from a natural animal host to a human being is called a spillover event. Spillover events are usually dreaded because these are viruses that the human body has not seen before. So humans have no natural immunity to them at all. Therefore, they completely they allow the virus to multiply 
without the immune system kicking in and doing something about it or preventing it from its track. It takes time for the immune system to build up its defenses. So SARS, MERS, and coronavirus, all these terms I've mentioned before, these are all examples of diseases that come to us from animals. The patients reported with various sets of symptoms to, into the Wuhan hospital. So these are now, I'm sure all of you are familiar with the set of symptoms. A dry cough is a symptom that is seen in something like 60, 60 to 70% of patients. A fever often, but not always accompanies a cough. Exhaustion is a common, is a, is a common symptom. Shortness of breath, another very common symptom. This is a respiratory disease. It can either sit in your upper respiratory tract or your lower respiratory tract at the end to way to your lungs. A shortness of breath is therefore in, usually associated with this. Even in patients who are what are technically called asymptomatic, who show no symptoms at all of the disease in terms of a dry cough or a fever or exhaustion, but nevertheless turn out to be positive if you actually test them for it. The shortness of breath is, may not be there, but they do seem to have some level of lung damage that turns up in CAT scans and even sometimes in x-rays. So that's an interesting thing that you can be ill and in fact your body can be affected without you even knowing it. A runny nose, abdominal pain are a little less uncommon, although they also happen to be symptoms of COVID-19. Most of these symptoms you'll notice are all flu-like. People with a flu or a cold could be forgiven for saying that these are just symptoms of a flu or a cold. I'm going to ignore them for the time being. What's important is that there are different families of involved in these, and you cannot identify the disease going by the symptoms alone. Unlike, for example, measles, which is very characteristic in terms of a person who has measles, you can see them immediately. A person who has smallpox or chickenpox, you can identify them immediately. But here you cannot identify the disease based on the symptoms alone. What you do need are lab tests, and there are a bunch of different lab tests. So the gold standard for lab tests is a conventional RT, or reverse transcriptase PCR, which is done by taking a swab from your throat or your nasal passages and running it through a complex uh, the test, which we, we need to worry about at this stage. What we know now about the disease is the following. Most infections are mild, and that accounts for about 80% of them. Asymptotic carriers are a specific and interesting feature of the disease. And interesting by, 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 by interesting, I mean very specific to this disease, and it's something whose implication we had not actually realized at the outset. A large fraction of people, and this number can range between 33% and 80%, depending upon who you're talking to and who's looking at the data, tend to be asymptomatic carriers. That is to say, they will not they are not exhibiting symptoms of the disease at that particular point when they turn up to be tested, although in principle, some of them could show symptoms of the disease at a later point. The question of whether there, is, there are people who are truly asymptomatic, who never show symptoms of the disease at all, even though they happen to be carrying it, is still a somewhat open question. It's believed that maybe about 20%, 30% of, of patients may actually be completely asymptomatic. We know now that those aged above 60, above 50 or 60 are most at risk, and the risk increases as you grow older, for no other real reason apart from the fact that you, are, in general, human frailty increases with age, and you are more likely not to be able to recover from something that happens to you, from an adverse event, health event that happens to you, if you happen to be 80 plus, and if you happen to be 20 plus, you just get up and dust yourself off and go right ahead with whatever you were doing, the younger you are. The other twist here is that people with pre-existing conditions, in particular people who are diabetic, are very much prone to adverse outcomes if they get COVID-19. The, interest, the, the, the reason for that is still being worked out. And one possible explanation is that COVID-19 is a much more complex disease than a simple vascular disease, than a simple uh, sort of respiratory disease. It may have vascular complications associated with that. And diabetes and vascular complications go somewhat together. So that's one reason why people with cardiovascular conditions, hypertension, diabetes, et cetera, should be especially careful not to be in the vicinity of someone who had COVID-19. There is a slight asymmetry between the way it affects men and women. It seems tends to affect men a little more strongly than it does women. So the ratio is somewhere between 60 to 40, 55 to 45, et cetera. The, the Indian data surprisingly seem to be the opposite way. It seems to affect women a little more than men. Whether this has to do with social circumstance, whether this has to do with pre-existing conditions, smoking, et cetera, which is more prevalent in men than women, we don't know yet. If you look at the diseases I told you about, MERS, SARS, COVID-19, and seasonal flu that afflicts all of us roughly once a year when it comes around. SARS and MERS killed a lot of the people it infected. MERS kills about 35% of the people it, that it infects. So you have a 35% chance of dying if you contract MERS, irrespective of your age. It affects both young and old equally. 
SARS killed about 9% to 10% of the people it affected. Still a smaller number, but nevertheless, a very large number in terms of, again, <clears throat> in, in terms of being, um, having a substantial effect on a population if it managed to spread through this. The conventional seasonal flu kills about 0.1%, typically the elderly in the population. Question is, where does COVID-19 fit in? So I rubbed out the number. You can see a question mark there. I rubbed out the number that was initially there because this number has been changing as our understanding of the disease has been expanding. This is called the infection fatality ratio, by the way. We'll come back to this quantity a little later. This is of the people it infects. What is the percentage of people who will die from that infection? For COVID-19, the number here has been predicted to be anywhere between 0.08%, which will put it less than seasonal flu in terms of its effect on mortality, to something like 1% to 3%, which would make it much more serious than seasonal flu in terms of mortality. We don't know this number yet. The feeling is that it may be smaller rather than larger, but we don't know where it fits in yet. This is where the world stands currently in terms of the current global cases of COVID-19. We have um, currently close to 10 million cases of COVID-19, around 470,000 deaths at this point, and a number of recoveries, which is comparable to that number, which is sort of an order of magnitude larger than that number. Look at the picture below, and that shows you that this, the number of cases, this is confirmed global COVID-19 cases, that number is still increasing. So we're nowhere near any sort of end to this pandemic. As long as this pandemic is fueled by the fact that there are more and more people susceptible to this disease, the disease can be expected to go to, to, to go to carry on and it's expected to widen its sphere. So if you look at the picture on the top, that's a picture that color codes all countries that have been affected by COVID-19. And at this point, there are 213 countries out of the 228 odd that are listed in the UN list of, of, of independent countries who have been affected by this. So really no country is immune from this at this point. This is confirmed COVID-19 cases per million people and on a color scale on a color scale where the darker colors correspond to more cases and the lighter colors, colors correspond to fewer cases per million. Look at this. So the US, Canada, very strongly affected. Brazil, a lot of the West Coast of South America. So that includes Peru, Ecuador, etc. A lot of continental Europe, including the UK, very badly affected. So that includes Spain, Portugal, Italy, France, etc. All the way, even Germany. Sweden, very strongly affected by the disease. You can see the swathe the blue that is right. Russia. Iran, you can see the Iran, Saudi Arabia, again, very strongly affected. India is a lighter shade because the number of cases per million people is still relatively small compared to these countries. And of course, as it points out in this graph, the main reason for these numbers being what they are can partly be attributed to testing differences between these two countries. If we tested much more, we would find many more cases. It's an is implicit statement over there. But you can see again that there's, again, no continent has been spared and there are regions that are dark, light colored and dark colored. There are regions that are dark colored in the midst of other light colored regions. So the geography of the spread is also somewhat interesting. Here is the comparison between the US, Russia, the UK, Brazil, and India. The US is by far the largest. The US has had the largest number of, of confirmed COVID-19 cases, followed by Brazil at 1.15 million cases. Again, so this is the BRICS country, Brazil, India, Russia, et cetera, et cetera. I haven't put China there because China is already saturated. The UK has seen 306,000, Russia 599,000. India now is, is in fourth place, probably moving up to third place at some point. And we'll have to see how far we can go. But look at the ascending trajectory of each of these curves. If you look at only at the Indian data for total confirmed cases, that is going up, but it appears to be rising roughly linearly. And I know this because I keep, when I show this, I keep updating the graph to the back. And all I need to do is to, re is to replace the graph on this thing. And then I might have to tilt this line slightly, but it still looks roughly linear. And this linearity gives you a doubling time of about 15 days. So this number has been oscillating between about 14 to 18 to 20 days for a while now. So that's not so bad. At the peak of its growth, this number was around four to five days. 15 to 20 days is, is reasonable from that point of view. Although countries which are over the peak or tending towards the peak tend to have this number much larger, between about 30 to 35 days. So we're nowhere near that. If you look at the number of deaths divided by the number of confirmed cases, this is called a case fatality rate. The United Kingdom sits on top, United States is below, Brazil is below, and then there's India. So our case fatality rates, the number of people who are dying once they have contract, who are listed as dying once they are listed as, being, as having contacted COVID-19, 
is actually relatively small. It's between uh, roughly about 3% is our best guess. This isn't a, good, a very good number because it relies, the denominator of this number is a confirmed case. It's the number of people who have been confirmed to have COVID-19. That is a function of who you test. If you didn't test anybody, you would have no one who's confirmed at all. And therefore you would have any number that you wanted for the CSR. If you tested very, very extensively, you would test many people who didn't have the disease and that would drive the case fatality rate below. So this is a number that's not to be so much trusted because it depends very, very strongly on your testing regime. But nevertheless, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's an index that people use to determine where they stand relative to other countries. If you ask on a metric of how many tests do we run daily per, per thousand people, the answer is that we do tend to have lower rates of testing than most countries. Well, not most countries, roughly about half the countries that are listed as having some reasonable number of COVID-19 cases. The United States is testing more than us, Canada is testing more than us, United Kingdom is testing more than us, South Korea certainly is testing more, even at this point. But India is, is the testing numbers in India are going up, they're, although they're going up somewhat gradually. But it's still a positive that our numbers are going up. We crossed a lack of tests, I think, yesterday. If you ask what has been the worldwide impact of COVID-19 in terms of, of fatality, how many people died of COVID-19? And to what extent can we attribute these deaths to COVID-19 and not to any other cause? That number here is computed by looking at what is called the excess deaths. And that's computed by asking how many people died over a similar period last year and the year before that and the year before that. And against that background, can we detect that COVID-19, that more people were dying of some other cause, apart from the regular causes that they used to die from earlier. For example, vehicular, vehicular accidents, cancer, hypertension, cardiac disease, et cetera, et cetera. How many, what is the excess about that? You can see from these, so this is a plot on the right-hand side, which is total excess deaths relative to the historical average for the same dates. You can see the UK is seeing something like 60% to 70% excess deaths. So you have 60% more people dying of COVID-19 attributable to COVID-19 over this period than to anything else over any previous period that you look. So the UK, Belgium, Netherlands, Spain, Italy, all of these are seeing an excess of mortality, which can be attributed directly to COVID-19. So this sort of put, gives a light to one particular statement that this is just like the flu. If it was just like the flu, we would have seen a relatively small increase over a background flu level, which is actually fairly small. This suggests that these numbers are actually higher than those of flu, that the people who've been dying so far are people who belong to risk groups that are also susceptible to the flu, but certainly have been affected more by COVID-19 than the flu had affected them previous years. So that's something to remember. Let's drill down into the India data. So currently in India, we have 456,183 cases. Ignore this. So this number is from, from, from the government source. The other number was from the from sort of aggregated data from multiple sources. So all of these numbers differ just a wee little bit. It doesn't really matter much. The government keeps having to try to reconcile the data that the states give it. And you can trust either one. It doesn't really make much of a difference. The number of cases went up by 15,000, which is the largest single day increase that we've seen. This happened between yesterday and today. We have had 14,476 deaths, up by 460 odds since yesterday. The states that, that have been affected are Maharashtra having the largest share, followed by Delhi, then Tamil Nadu. So Delhi edged out Tamil Nadu in this particular sweepstakes a few days ago. Then Gujarat, Uttar Pradesh, Rajasthan, etc., etc., etc. These are all confirmed cases of, of, of COVID-19. Again, I must emphasize that the numbers here depend upon how much you test. The more you test, the more likely it is that you are to find cases, especially in the background of many people who have COVID-19 in some form or the other. So the question is, how much are you testing? And as you increase your testing, how many more cases are you finding? This is a picture of, of the districts in India, again, color-coded with the darker shades being more cases and the lighter cases being fewer shades. So this is between the 28th of May and the 24th of June. And you can see that a whole lot of India has been filled in with darker and darker shades. There was a chunk around middle India, around Jharkhand, Madhya Pradesh, etc., which had a lighter shade earlier with the 1 to 10 cases. But now it's become darker. That's moved to 11 to 100. And other parts of India have become much darker. Much of Maharashtra, including areas in which you, all of you are currently in Pune, have now fleshed out into a darker shade as the epidemic has spread beyond the cities to which it was initially confined. This is test per million people versus test positivity ratio. Test positivity ratio is the number of, people, number of positives on a test divided by the number of tests. And the test per million people is how many tests you're actually doing. 
ideally you would want to be as far on the right as possible, test as many people as you can, and you would like to have as small a test positivity ratio as possible, so it'd be as further down as you can. So the states that you can see on the upper right-hand quadrant have a large test positivity ratio, and also somewhere in between a sort of medium test per million people where you have Delhi furthest to the right in terms of the largest number of tests per million people, Maharashtra on the top, which is a large test positivity ratio, Tamil Nadu below, which is somewhere in between Delhi and, and, and Maharashtra in terms of the number of tests per million people and a lower test positivity ratio. So there's a lot of information here that's hidden in, 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 um, in complex ways about how different tests are, different states are responding to the situation. This is a more interesting graph and this is fairly complex. So I'll tell you what this is. So this plots two things. On the x-axis is the time scale. On the y-axis on the left is the test per 1 million population. On the x, on the y-axis on the right is a percentage of infection that you detect. So that's the case, that's the case, the case, the case, uh, to the case ratio, case positivity ratio. What you want to do is to have as small numbers on the right as possible. But the interesting thing is the correlation that you should look at between ramped up testing and ramped up people turning positive. Look at Delhi, which is the top left-hand corner, and you can see these two curves track each other. As you ramp up testing, you're actually seeing more and more people turning positive. That is not a good situation. So that says that the number of people in the, in, in, in the background population who are positive is actually much larger. So even with limit, limited testing, it's completely unable to catch them. Look at the other state, JNK comes down. Tamil Nadu has gone up with somewhat little slope, but seems to be saturating, which is a good sign. So as you ramp up testing further, and Tamil Nadu saw a huge increase in testing over the last few weeks, then as you ramp up testing, your test positivity is not going up at the same rate, but probably saturating even a little. And there's more information here between Maharashtra, where both of them seem to be going up a little bit. It's still not very convincing. States that show really weird wiggles in the data because they suddenly started testing a lot in between, etc. West Bengal started high. It's coming down a little bit. But again, there are worries there about the quality of the data. A high test positivity rate means almost certainly that you're not testing anyone who's infected. You're really only testing people with a high probability of having an infection, and you're not seeing people with milder systems or people who are asymptomatic. If you test broadly, you should encounter many more people who are not infected than people who are infected. So that should drag your test positivity rate down. So look at the picture on the top, which is Mexico as a function of time, and the test positivity is going up. Right now, it's a number of about 50%. So roughly one in two people that you test is turning out to be positive for COVID-19. That is not a good situation. Indian numbers, worst Indian numbers tend, are somewhere around 10 to 15%. But here you have 50%, which is really a huge public health issue for Mexico. Let me now get to the question of, of why one should model in the first place, because I think this is something that, since a lot of you think about models in various other contexts, you, you, all of you are, are data people who worry about what the data represents, and mathematical and formal ways of thinking about it. Let me tell you a little bit about the models, the way people think about models and the way we conceptualize our own models for these things. A model is important because it tells you what to expect. And this is unlike models that we use in physics where, there is, where you know, the stakes are somewhat less than in this particular case. The ability to plan ahead is very important for public health. How many beds do I expect how to be used in the next week or the week after that? How many ICU, ICU units and how many ventilators do I, will I think I will require in about a month's time? The other use for models is that it enables you to compare at some level what are called non-pharmaceutical interventions. A pharmaceutical intervention is a medicine, an antiviral drug, or it could also be something like a vaccine. If you had a vaccine which you could give to large numbers of people at the same time, that would certainly stem the course of the disease. But in the absence of a vaccine, and we certainly have no vaccine at the moment, what you need to be able to do is to try and understand what happens if you impose a lockdown, if you impose mask wearing, if you impose physical segregation at various levels, if you, if you have a smaller number of people going to work at any given time. The final point is that thinking about models gives you better intuition for how diseases might spread. At what rate and at what level will it spread from the cities to the places surrounding cities? To what extent did the migrant motion from the cities to distant districts far away from those cities? To what extent will that help in creating a second wave of disease about a month, two months down the line? What are the questions that we could ask about an epidemic? So the first question is, how do diseases affect populations? And this is the field of epidemiology. And the picture there is just a genetic picture that you might think 
about what is the proportion of people with ill health and how does this proportion change with time. The best way that we know to think about this comes from work that's now about 90 years old. And it comes from the work of two Scotsmen, Kermack and McKendrick. And these two very remarkable people set into place the basic models that we use and the basic language that we use to think about how diseases, how infectious diseases spread between person to person. So their idea was fairly simple. They said, let's just imagine that from the point of view of disease alone, we can categorize everybody in a given population into three baskets. The first basket is a susceptible basket, people who have not contracted the disease yet. The second basket is the infected basket, people who are currently infected with the disease and can transmit that disease to people who are susceptible. And the third basket is the people who have recovered from the disease. And the recovered basket could be subdivided into people who have died from the disease, people who have recovered from the disease, people who have partial immunity to the disease and people who have full immunity to the disease. We can introduce all of these levels of complexity. So now you can imagine that everyone in a population can be put into one of these three baskets. At the beginning, everyone is susceptible to the disease because this is a novel disease. Human beings have not seen it earlier. We have no pre-existing immunity to the disease. Once you introduce an infected person, someone flying in from, let's say, from, from China or from some other place, once they come in, then you have introduced an inf infected person into the population. And then your susceptible people can begin to get infected on their own. You can imagine the progress of the disease as people moving from susceptible to infected to recovered compartments. So that's a set of arrows between these compartments that are shown here. The only twist here, the nonlinearity here, is that the susceptible people on their own will never get infected. You need susceptible and infected people to come close together, to be in proximity, before a susceptible person can be transferred from the susceptible compartment to the infected compartment. The process of recovery by which an infected person recovers or dies, as the case may be. Sometimes in place of recovered, we use the word remove, which is somewhat more genetic and general terminology. And that happens as a function of time for most viral diseases, for example, like the common flu or even in, or, or just, a, just, just cold. You recover over a period of about three days. You may be miserable in between, but it's almost guaranteed that you will recover with no other problem. This interaction between susceptible individuals and infected individuals is, as, as I said, the nonlinear interaction that gives rise to this whole flow between compartments. And Kermack and McKendrick were the first to write down these genetic flow equations that describe how people move from one compartment to the other. Obviously, the more the infected numbers, the more susceptible people they can infect. So all of this has to go into the modeling. The equations that you will see to the right here, and I'm not going to explain this because I want to get to the phenomena more than that, is to take the description that I showed you earlier, and to write a set of three coupled nonlinear ordinary differential equations that describe exactly the same physics. This has two parameters, a beta and a gamma, but it turns out that I can scale out one of these, I can scale the gamma out, and the only dimension less parameter is beta divided by gamma. And that is a particularly important parameter, it's called the basic reproductive ratio. And in a sense, that is fundamental to the set of equations. These equations here, all of the behavior of these, these equations is described by the basic reproductive ratio, which is the parameter that enters the description of these equations. And it's these equations that tell you how the numbers in each of these compartments changes as time goes on. Here's one example of a success in modeling. So you can see data and a curve there. You can see the data are the black dots that you see. You can see them start off small, go up high, and then come down. Again, the line that you see, which is connected by the, the, the line connecting these little open circles here is a theory line. And that comes from the theory that Kermack and McKendrick worked, worked on between 1926 and 1929. This is old history, old data from the 1906 plague epidemic in Bombay. So the plague, plague epidemic, so this is data from about, about 30 to 32 weeks across which the plague epidemic started. You saw the increase in the number of cases, and then you saw the number of cases come down. This is very generic epidemic curve. You, you see an epidemic build up. It rises exponentially in the beginning, rises to a peak, and then comes down. So always with any epidemic, the question is, where are we relative to that peak? Where is the peak, and where might we affect it? You can see from here that this is an almost perfect fit within the incredible complexity of, of the just that are summarized in just the number of infected people who turn up to hospitals and are diagnosed with the disease in terms of the theoretical ideas that go into describing this particular problem. Here is a solution of these equations of motion. The susceptible people come down. The infected people go up and then come down. So that's a red curve that you see at the bottom. And the number of people who recover start at zero, and then they saturate to some value. The way these equations are written is that at any 
time, the number of susceptibles plus the number of infected plus the number of recovered must always add up to the total number in the population. You can, of course, generalize this in multiple ways. You can have births, you can have deaths, you can have all sorts of complicated stuff happening in between. And much of work on these models, of course, goes beyond the simple SIR model that these people worked on. And all of these models, however, ask really the basic, the same set of fundamental questions. Will the disease spread? How many people will be infected by the disease? And all of these answers to these questions depend, as I said, on one fundamental quantity called the basic reproductive ratio. It's called R0 or R0. And that tells you that, in a sense, is the most basic quantity that you can ask about a particular epidemic. That is the answer to the question. If you go back and look at those equations again, the, the answer that that quantity provides is a simple answer. So for every one person who is sick in a background of people who are completely susceptible, how many people on average does that sick person go on to infect? For Ebola, the number is two. For swine flu, the number is two. For HIV, it's four. For smallpox, it's seven. And for measles, it's 18. That means that if you have a class of children and one child has measles, you can be pretty sure that by the end of the week, all the children in the class will have measles because measles is just so efficient at propagating between person and person. Given what we've said about the fact that, given what you know about the fact that Ebola is such a dreaded disease, why is the reproductive ratio of Ebola just two? The answer is that it's not very easy to contract Ebola. You actually have to contract the bodily fluids of someone who has Ebola, who has died with Ebola. And that's not so easy. Just being in the same room with them doesn't make a difference. It really will not give you Ebola at all. But that's the reason why people who deal with Ebola patients are completely suited with, with protective gear. And even the burial of Ebola patients must be done completely with protective gear. So you can see why the reproductive ratio is important. And now the question is, where does COVID-19 fit in here? And the answer is that's very, very difficult to say. And the basic reproductive ratio, of course, this is defined as a quantity before you actually implement any sort of, of corrective measure, is, is, is a special quantity. So that is called R0. And the number for R0 is somewhere between 2.5 and 3 is our best guess at this point. If R is greater than one, you have at every stage, you have more people infecting, more people infecting, more people. And if R equal to one, for every case, it infects on average one more case. So that's a case where the epidemic neither dies down nor does it increase. For R less than one, that is a situation where the disease is, is contained. Even though you have 20 or 50 or 100 or 500 people with the disease initially, that number will go down with time because at each time step, they're infecting fewer and fewer people than they initially stood for, than they initially represent. So as I said, R0 is somewhere between two and three, but currently R is lower because of all of the measures that have been used due to social distancing, the lockdown, et cetera. And the best estimate now for what is R0 is currently somewhere around 1.3 to 1.4 at the end of, of, of a lockdown, of a long lockdown at this point. So could it even be a little smaller than that? The more complex version of this model is called the SEIR model, which puts in an additional state called the exposed state in between. So you have susceptible, becoming exposed to the disease, becoming infected, becoming removed. And in the exposed disease, exposed compartment and the infected compartment, you could potentially infect the susceptible people. I want to tell you a little bit about the model that we ourselves have been working on. This is called the INSISIM model. And this is a model that a group of scientists called Indian Scientists Response to COVID-19. Some of you are members of this organization. There's somewhere between 600 and 700 scientists from all across India who work with this group. It's a voluntary group of scientists below the radar for most, most purposes. It, it concentrates on the public interface with science of telling the public about what is COVID-19, what are precautions, why you should not be fooled by multiple hoaxes, what is the available information that is relevant to you and to your daily life about COVID-19. And as part of that, there's a group of about nine people, including people from Pune, Bangalore, Chennai, Ashoka, and so on, who've been working on developing a model that is very specifically India-centered to deal with COVID-19. The, this, what you see at the top panel is the web page of the Indian Scientist response to COVID-19. I'll encourage you to go and look at it. The reports of the modeling team, there have been three reports so far. The first one defined the basic model and the first set of results. Then we looked at the application of what are called periodic lockdowns to say which type of periodic lockdown might be most efficient in dealing with the disease. And the last was estimating the national impact, the national lockdown impact, which is May 26. And we do for another um, piece of output here shortly. There's also a uh, 
a, a tool which any of you can use to try it out. It has, it's a statewide tool currently. So you can put in Maharashtra state, put in the numbers there and see given your estimates for how it might spread, your estimates for what, what types of lockdown, what types of numbers ought to go in there. You can try and see what effect that has on the propagation of the disease. So this is a state-of-the-art compartmental model for COVID-19 spread. Right now, it's a district-level model. So we're going to put up the district-level tool very shortly. We wanted to also introduce benchmark rates for all modelers working in this area in the country to say that, look, here are the best rates that we know for COVID-19 spread in India. We wanted to put in demographic, detailed descriptions of different populations, state-wise, district-wise, et cetera, as well as migration between states and districts and, and in cities. We wanted specifically to look at non-pharmaceutical interventions, which I told you about, and to provide an online tool so that anyone could test what we were actually doing. So the idea here is to replace the SEIR by a much more complicated progression of the disease across various patients. So as, has, as I said, some patients move from being susceptible to being exposed, and then they stay asymptomatic for the disease. They show no symptoms, but they could potentially infect other people. You can have people who are mildly infected by the disease who might have symptoms of a cold or a fever or, or a flu for a couple of days. They remain infectious within that period and belong it, but then they recover. You can have people who are severely infected, which means that they will show symptoms at some point, they will go to the hospital and then they will recover. And then you can have a situation where you have people who are critically ill who will need to go to hospital. Some of them will need to go to the ICU. Some of them will need to go to a ventilator and some of them will die. So all of these distinctions are there in our model. And we can describe how the time course of, of, of an infection in this particular way. So this takes the SCIR model that I told you about and replaces it by the picture that you see below. All of these nine different compartments and lots of transition rates between these compartments. And the real meat behind this are the rates at which you move from compartment to compartment. And for that, you need to look at the literature in some care and try to identify what is it that we know for how long does someone who's pre-symptomatic move to the asymptomatic stage? How long does someone who is, who is exposed to the disease move to the infectious stage, et cetera, et cetera. So right, as I said, this is for states, now we have districts, we describe detailed age structuring. So we describe a model in which we have zero to 10, 10 to 20, 20 to 30, et cetera, et cetera. Because we know that the disease affects people of different ages differently. We have migration in the model. We have healthcare accessibility within the model. How easy is it to get to a hospital or to have where, whichever district you belong to? What is the quality of healthcare within that district? And we also put in various metrics for healthcare inside that. We look at population models for cities and imagine people moving back and forth across the network of 318 cities. We do this for, for states and districts as well. We look at migration along the connected nodes that define these. And there's lots of technical details that I can tell you about later. What do we learn from this exercise? Well, the first thing is we, it's an important point really that lockdowns don't get rid of the epidemic. All that a lockdown does is to postpone the epidemic. So that's the picture to the top left where you have an, uh, a lockdown that is imposed and you have infected and hospitalized. You can't see the colors very clearly, unfortunately, on this particular projection, but there's a period of a lockdown. So you can have a look at the situation with the lockdown and without the lockdown. If you have, without the lockdown, you have a certain peak in the number of infected, which comes down in a very classic epidemic way. With the lockdown, you have a small growth of cases during the lockdown period, but then grows to exactly the same number that you had. It's only shifted to the right later in time. In order to really change the course of the disease, you need to change something about the way people transfer the disease to each other, change the infectivity parameter or change the R0, the reproductive ratio. And there you can see in the picture on the top left, you can see the curve, the epidemic curve, the rise in number of infected and the coming down, shifting to the right, as well as lowering in the intensity. The total number of infected at the peak has now gone down. By doing what we call quarantining and testing, which is identifying cases, removing them from the population, preventing them from infecting other people, we found that you could reduce the value of that piece. So that was one thing that we stressed in the modeling work that we did, that the importance of quarantining and testing, much as many other people have been pointing out, can exactly be quantified in the numerical work that we were doing. So lockdowns with quarantining and testing reduces the peak, that's certainly one point. We looked at many different types of lockdown. What happens if you put in a lockdown in which everyone stays at home for a week, goes to work for a week, stays at home for a week, goes to work for a week? And what happens in the case where you have one third of the population going to work, two thirds staying under lockdown conditions, then the one third comes back after three days and the second of the thirds goes there and works for three days and then comes back. So everyone is at lockdown for two, for two thirds of the time, but one third of the time they actually go out to work. So we suggested this was actually a very effective way. So it was initially done 
by an Israeli group. We took that suggestion over. We looked at a whole bunch of different parameters in our much more complicated model than the Israeli model actually worked on and found that the asynchronous lockdown was actually a much better situation than synchronous lockdown. We did some work on estimating the number of, of deaths within this model. So on the top, top picture there, you can see a picture of, that shows data for the total number of, 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 of deaths. And you can see a line that runs through that. And that line is our modeling line. And that is a line that incorporates the effects of the lockdown. So this is what we said describes the lockdown within a particular model. And now, if you ask, all right, you have managed to match the number of deaths. What can you match the number of cases that were actually detected at that point? And the answer is that you have this large discrepancy between the number of cases that we predict ought to be there, even with the lockdown in place, even with our fitting to the number of deaths, and the number of cases that were actually seen. So our estimate was that we are simply not seeing between 20 to 30 times the number of cases that have actually been reported. So that factor of 20 to 30 has now become sort of more commonly used. We were the first to point out that there was a large discrepancy in the number, and this was important. And now that discrepancy seems to have narrowed a little bit in states which, which test more extensively seem to have smaller values of that discrepancy versus states that test much less. Let's now get into larger questions about lockdowns, interventions, what do the data say, et cetera. So one question that, that will have uh, occurred to you, we may have discussed this, is the question of, did India lock down too early? And what do we know about lockdowns? Already I've said that lockdowns can only postpone the peak of the infection. It doesn't really change it at a, at, a, at a quantitative level. And that sort of goes back to the argument that, again, lockdowns are useful only so that you can prepare for the effects of the disease. And that's really what it was done. This shows you an estimate of total excess deaths on the y-axis versus lockdown day infection, the number of infections at, on the day in which you expose and impose a lockdown. And you can see the linear relationship. The earlier you, you, you lock down, the smaller your number of excess deaths. The later you lock down, the larger the number of excess deaths. So the UK sits way to the right. The UK locked down very late, the US locked down very, very late. So they're seeing a large number of excess deaths due to the spread of the coronavirus. Important to note. Let me go to what happens next, because this I think is a crucial question that, that many of you may be having about what is it that we can understand, what is it that we can think about what happens to the disease. So as I said, if you didn't do anything, that's a red curve. It goes up and it comes down. You can calculate this with the standard models of infectious diseases, like the ones that I wrote down. Any sort of, of non-pharmaceutical interventions, for example, physical distancing, mask wearing, et cetera, will suppress that curve and shift it to the right. So it flattens the curve. Any lockdown, any, any sort of intervention that is imposed and then removed will always run the risk of further increase. So that's what we expect now. We're seeing, in fact, we're seeing now as the number of cases has gone up from about 7,000 to 8,000 per day, or even smaller than that during the lockdown period, to a number that has cost 15,000 per day in the current situation. So that resurgence is what we're actually seeing. And so now the question is, how do you prevent that resurgence from happening? Or how do you suppress that resurgence as far as you can actually do? There's a bunch of data coming out of the government which says India's fatality rate is among the lowest in the world. Well. The answer to that is the fatality rate of COVID-19 is intrinsically very small. The best guess is somewhere between 0.3 and 0.6%. It also depends very sharply on age. The median age in India is 29 years. It's younger in Pakistan, which is 23, and 27 in Bangladesh. Whereas if you looked at the United States, the median age is 38. If you looked at Britain, it's 40.5. If you looked at Italy, it's 45. These are older populations than the Indian population. Add to that the fact that in India, because we have a young population, because we know that young populations, young people typically will not have adverse or fatal outcomes when exposed to the disease, you can say that the reason that our fatality rate is small isn't all that surprising. We really should be on much the lower end of this altogether. The second point is that most patients will recover from the disease. And again, this question of our recovery rate is going on, we have more recovered, people are recovering than ever before, et cetera, et cetera. The answer is that most people will actually recover. That's a standard notion of an infectious disease. Only a small percentage will die in this particular case because the infection fatality ratio is really very small. It's, it's, it's less than 1%, the best that we can tell. From New York City, the data that we have indicated that 73% of all the people who died were among patients who were age 65 or older. Only 5% of the Indian population falls in this, in this particular category, as opposed to 16% of the American category. So they do have older people. Older people will have adverse outcomes, they will die. And therefore, their recovery is 
will be always will be smaller in number than the recoveries that we have because our population is young and really youth is sort of crucial our demographics is really crucial to understanding what might happen to india long term the other question is that earlier people came to hospital in the terminal stages of the disease when pretty much other things had failed they were within about 3 to 5 days of dying and testing was very restrictive at that particular point as you expand testing as we are currently doing now although still not reach the level of expansion that we should have the more people who are mildly affected you will pick up the more the mildly infected all of those mildly infected will typically recover from the disease and therefore your fatality rate should continuously decrease there is absolutely no surprise in that okay this is called the iceberg problem of how testing policy affects covid-19 rates so look at germany the, the pyramid for germany in terms of symptom no symptoms mild illness severe illness and death and the pyramid for the uk which is severe disease and uk right and, and death right at the top and mild and moderate below if you were only testing at the top of the pyramid you're only testing more serious cases and these are those who are most likely to die therefore your your deaths divided by cases will tend to be higher as it was in the uk the more broader you base the testing you pick up those with mild and moderate illness and of these a smaller fraction is expected to die therefore your death rate will be smaller so all of this is complicated and has to do with the detailed epidemiological question of how you understand the numbers behind a particular disease most patients will recover from the disease over time more and more will recover only a small fraction will die so it's often a sort of piece of advice is that it's not good to estimate these in the midst of a pandemic you're always confused by you don't know can't estimate the disease uh, those infected correctly you have not been able to estimate it, the number of deaths correctly it these results are best extracted somewhat later in the pandemic preferably right at the end of the pandemic this is a graph that i want you to look at as i as i finished up and that's the number of 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 deaths and cases uh, with this those are plotted here total confirmed deaths which is the little red part that you see there and total confirmed cases of covid-19 I want you to look at the shapes of these curves. I want you to look at the shape for China. So the shape for China is something that goes up very steeply and then saturates. So China is seeing a relatively small increase in the number of cases now, mainly a cluster that happened in Beijing, but much of of China is not seeing a sustained increase in the number of cases. South Korea is seeing a sort of plateau, a slight increase. UK is slightly increasing, but you can sense. the plateau that's turning up to the right hand side of that italy has already seen its plateau so it's gone up and flattened out india is very different from this india if anything looks like the united states at the end it's still rising sharply there's no trace of anything that is like a curving over and that's very important because this question of where is the peak for india where does it come where do we expect it really relies on data like this and looking at in comparatively across different countries in the course of infection across different countries you can see that india is really nowhere where these other countries are we still have quite a way to go in terms of covid-19 so remember that the goal is somehow to to move r less than 1 to get a reproductive ratio that is smaller than 1 you can do this by imposing a lockdown so that you get a fresh start identify people within their homes who follow nil with this and pull them out test trace and isolate those particular people and finally all of this you have to do until you have a vaccination in place so the vaccine is the final crucial component of this getting a vaccine that is safe and effective and can be rolled out at large scale to the bulk of the population that you have until some sort of immunity can then be guaranteed especially if you roll it out to elderly people people who are most in danger because they're immunocompromised in some way then having protected them you can then shift to the younger people in the population who are potentially less at risk until finally you have covered the entire population but the methods of how you do this in the first place will you be able to ramp up vaccine capabilities to that level are all questions that we have to address in at the point at which we begin to find a vaccine for the disease let me finish up with this particular quote because i find it interesting so this is mark mazzanetti of of the new york times who said that the odd thing about reporting on the coronavirus is that the non experts are supremely confident to their prediction while epidemiologists keep telling me that they really don't know much at all so this is just an antidote to to the many models that you have been seeing in the newspapers this model says as peak saying even the government has sort of gone so far as to show you models in which you have the number of cases declining to zero at a specified date within about a few weeks of when the prediction was first made you should be very skeptical of any model slash modeler who any gives you anything like a precise date a precise time by which this will vanish does not tell you about the confidence intervals on those particular numbers does not specify a range of possible outcomes 
does not account for a lot of the complexity of the disease, the way it spreads between people, or the complexity that we have learned up till now. So I think it's good for modelers to be, you know, to, to keep reiterating to the public that look, we live in a world where our knowledge is imperfect, our models are imperfect. Our models are only as good as the data that goes into them, as well as the constant rethinking, the restructuring of the parameters that go into the model. You should never trust a model for the really long term, because God, in the long run, we're all dead, as an American novelist first put it. But certainly over the short term, this will give you some of the useful answers to questions that you might want to ask. How many people will be infected by the end? How many people will be taken to the ICU? What should you budget in terms of ICU beds? For all of this, you need models. You need models desperately. And so there is this tension between requiring a model. You cannot get these numbers from pure thought alone. And the tension that modelers should have about reporting data that are more accurate than they have a right to be. Because modelers should be intensely aware of the fact that there are many that there are many gaps in what we understand about a modern physics. So let me stop there and let me thank all of you for your, for your patience and listening to this entire talk. I think I finished pretty much on the dot and I have time for questions. So thank you so much. Thanks very much, Gautam. I mean, you uh, thanks for keeping to the time. And uh, um, uh, I know people will have questions. Uh, so um, I'm asking people who are online to um, uh, ask questions by raising their hand first. So if you go into the participants window and you will, you will come across a, a, a button which says raise hand and please raise your hand and I'll unmute you and let you ask questions. Uh, Gautam has about 15 minutes or so before he has to go on to another meeting. And so we'll try to conclude by then. Uh, John Pace has had a hand raised up uh, for may a long time. So start, John. Hi there. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah. Uh, so something I've heard mixed uh, reports about, can recovered people be reinfected with COVID-19? And also more generally, can recovered people be a carrier for COVID-19? <clears throat> That's a good question. The best that we know now is that recovered people, provided they've recovered properly, are no longer carriers of COVID-19. They may carry traces of viral RNA in their bodies. And the, the test is very sensitive to that. So the problem is that the, 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 the standard um, PCR method is an extremely sensitive test. So it's picking up pieces of virus, but that person, those are not live pieces of virus in the sense of being useful at infecting someone else. So it's most likely that these are people who uh, have recovered from the disease, have recovered conclusively from the disease. They have probably infected by something else or their recovery was not complete. That's another possibility. But it would be very rare if someone was completely de novo infected again, at least as far as we know about the disease. We don't know enough about immune response to the disease, how long your immunity lasts. We believe it may at least last for a few months. It certainly would rule out the cases that you're talking about, which were people who reported within a few weeks of, of, of recovering from the disease and coming back. But we really don't know whether this lasts for six months to two years to lifetimes. And, and this is something that really has to be sorted out at the immunological level. So there's a lot of work that remains to be done on that particular question. But the answer is no. As far as we know, it, it doesn't seem possible for people who have been infected and recovered once to be capable of acquiring the disease again or being infectious to other people. Sanjit next. Sanjit, go ahead. Uh, so my question is about, uh, uh, has anyone, uh, because you have been doing so much precise model, uh, has anyone tested the impact of testing strategy on the numbers? So what I mean is that says we cannot test all the people. We are testing only a very fraction of it. And then the asymptomatic people are spreading much lesser than the symptomatic ones. And then I see reports that in Delhi, like 75% of the people are like asymptomatic and so on. So did anyone study this part? So it, it turns out to be hard to do this in the sort of models that we work with. To, 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 I mean, we do, these are inputs to the model. They're not something that comes out of the model. And it's hard to design testing strategy around that. The better models for that are something called agent-based models. There are people in Pune who work on this. In fact, there's a big collaboration between Ashoka and a Pune-based company called ThoughtWorks, which is trying to build up a large agent-based model that will represent the whole of India. That's, that's the sort of ultimate goal, to have something that can have 1.3 billion, 8 billion agents on a computer, which are sort of matched to local demographics, population, health status, etc., etc. In such a scenario, you can ask this question very precisely. 
You can actually control the number of people, number of asymptomatics, how disease is transferred. You can also ask it geographically. If I have an out, uh, outbreak of disease here, but in Malad versus somewhere else, versus you know some place in Pune, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, I can say what is the nature of the testing strategy in these particular locations? Exactly how much should I ramp it up in that location versus other locations? And how do I update these, these strategies as time goes on? So those models are the ideal models to do it. We haven't started doing it yet, and I've seen no work. on that is really targeted at that it's a very good question and um, we as i said you know the agent based model is the best way to discuss that particular question so i wouldn't trust other models quite to be able to give you answers to that but great question great thanks uh, uh, suresh next uh, hello dr man uh, my question pertains to modeling india as a monolith uh essentially if we are like many men like many times the united states population i mean united kingdom's population and uh if you look at your last slide which shows uh, uh the indian growth rate of cases of deaths per cases and united kingdom's deaths per cases we very much feels like we are in the very beginning of a of a growth rate of a growth and uh can we really uh, extrapolate that to the entire indian population and uh, would it be fairer to take it up in a regional basis and uh, so you are yeah. you are completely right never believe anything that is a pan india prediction it just doesn't make sense at all which is why in the sequence of modeling that we've done we sort of started with states but now we're moving to districts and we have 738 odd districts so that's a level of of granularity that we would like we actually would like to do more we'd like to do sub districts within those districts towns etc but beyond the point the modeling just gets somewhat more complicated in terms of just the number of equations that you have to solve already remember this is for any for any district you have seven age age populations inside there are lots of complicated interaction multiply this by set of nine equations that are complicated non linear coupled to each other so 9 into 7 into 738 is the number of equations that are actually solving in order to get to this and you are also confused by the fact that inputs to these equations are not very well defined because you have to rely on fragmented testing strategies something is good in kerala something is not great in punjab etc etc so even the quality of the inputs determines very very specifically the quality of the stuff that comes out so garbage in garbage out is one issue that that we have to that we have to think about so i would not so the question is completely correct never believe anything that is a pan india prediction always tend to trust predictions that are much more local much more you know probably even wards within cities i think is about the about the, the the sort of smallest safe limit that you can actually use they are still limited in the to the extent that we which we can do that but that is something to keep in mind the second question was where are we so my feeling is that really we are seeing the start of the pan, of, of the epidemic in india we are nowhere near the point where it will curve over our best estimates suggest that probably end july mid august is where you should see some level of of sort of turning over in a peak we hope to postpone that and to push that peak down as much as possible with whatever which is that we can do certainly we've understood the importance of mask wearing much more than we did earlier and that seems to be the single most powerful public health intervention that we can possibly do so the more people wear masks the more people are, are careful about touching surfaces we have to sanitize the surfaces that we work with reduce interactions in which more than 10 or 20 people gather together in close proximity all of these make a difference with that we can hope to spread the peak out over a much longer period and to to reduce the value at that peak as well but best guess is probably mid august mid to end august would be my own best guess as i said this is a guess never trust anything that i say that that is more than a week in advance uh, the, the hosts can't raise hands so uh, and among the hosts of this meeting is surud more who wants to ask a question so um, before indule khan go to um, squeeze surud in squeeze surud go and ask ask the question yeah thanks so much so uh, gautam thanks for the talk um, i wanted to ask a few things and i may have missed this Uh, so, did you try to actually model the excess number of deaths that have happened in India, uh, just like you showed for the other countries? I didn't see India there. No. Uh, so, the in India is not there because we have a very very bad handle on excess deaths. I in see. India, around seventy okay, numbers differ from place to place, but sixty to seventy deaths are recorded. Only about twenty percent of deaths are is a cause of death actually recorded, and that really makes life very difficult because certainly in in more rural areas. you would hardly ever record a cause of death there are additional incentives for doctors not to record a death as a covid-19 death 
there are social social circumstances that are involved right. there families might not in, not, not need to have a family member especially an elderly family member recorded as having died of covid-19 because then they would have to self isolate they would declare that they would that they were in the proximity of a person like this there are incentives for doctors not to do this because then the clinics would have to be shut down or to be disinfected there's a large scale changes involved there right there have been as as you know even yeah. from 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 news reports there is reports of a factor of 2 to 3 difference between the number of deaths recorded in crematoria and in 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 uh, in in burial grounds versus the numbers that for example the delhi government was putting out as covid-19 deaths right so yeah. yeah i mean the excess number of deaths will reveal that right so uh, i mean even if it is like 60 to 70% lower yeah. um the excess number compared to the say previous year or yeah that's so that's okay. absolutely right but let me let me just point out one particular twist or multiple twist to this right yeah. this is that people are not dying of road accidents right the road accident is an extremely important part of public health the 150000 people die of in road accidents every year and this is criminal by any you know by by any sure. any stretch of the imagination Right, yeah. So you've removed that completely. People mm-hmm. tend to be killing other people less. Again, this is interesting. There are fewer murders now. <laughs> It's also That's true that deaths that deaths are generally fewer in times of economic difficulties. And this is again an interesting fact that has been known since the times of the Great Depression. That fatality rates, all-cause mortality, tends to decline during depressions and 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 straitened economic circumstances relative to the background. In all mortality, death rates tend to decrease when cardiac surgeons go on vacation. again all of this is sort of hard to put together into any sort of model form it's very important to do it to actually look at all cause mortality and to look at effects above that is very important to look at right. it hasn't started in india yet we'd like to do that too in as part of this insight call initiative yeah yeah so yeah, yeah. so yet. so that's great so if i may ask another question so this is about the opening strategy, strategy itself yeah, awesome But, question yeah do okay. you think it is reasonable given the preparations we have made uh, like the state that we are right now in terms of opening um and is it sensible uh, what is your take on that i think opening had to happen i mean it's impossible to sort of to to the the, the impact this has had on our economy on our informal economy in terms on 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 the people who had to walk back in cases hundreds and hundreds of kilometers back to distant air places from the places they were working this is not sustainable i think overall we have been a lot of cities now are effectively under some kind of lockdown there are parts of delhi but chennai is under lockdown i've been under a fairly stringent lockdown for the past for the past week right up to the end of the month i understand that that the bengal will be under lockdown till the end of of july from what i understand from something yesterday so we've actually emerged from this it's not really an unlock in 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 a real sense is sort of patchy lockdown still in place some places a little unlocked etc cetera, etc cetera, with the threat of a lockdown being imposed again so i wish that had been done a little more coherently with an idea of what was actually going to be done what are the sort of lines that you would draw in the sand to say that this is what we will do if this happens if that happens etc thereby giving some incentive to people to understand where they stood relative to the numbers but i think people now understand the importance of many many public health issues for example mask wearing as i said which is the canonical public health intervention of most value here with that i hope you can unlock down because people now understand this so it's an entreaty to you to tell people who are not wearing masks to wear masks because that helps to keep all of us safe at some level especially those with some pre existing condition so tumga i have three or four more questions i, I hope uh, i i promise to release you before your your cut off time what uh, time is it it's uh, it's 12 past and uh, uh, another, we have another five more minutes or so. sure yeah um indulekha go ahead please yeah i just had this uh, uh, feeling from physics that you said the number of infections go as the the number uh, who are already infected and interacting with the susceptible in physics uh, the chance of interactions goes up with the number density so treating india like a question comes up and going down to district levels or how does this relate to population density one question the ebola boom how much do you expect in, in india to get a covid boom and the third would be has the experience of italy allowed one to estimate given a whole population what percent is likely to be susceptible or everybody is susceptible which were i which I'll think I'll, i'll i'll take the third question first everybody is susceptible so that that's completely clear there's no one who has who has any uh, sort of heightened ability to deal with it as far as we know we're all susceptible this is something our bodies have never seen earlier 
So the first point is actually those equations that I wrote were a little simplified. I got rid of factors of n and so on. The population size does enter into that. So when we talk about districts, we have to put in the population size of that particular district. Population that density. Calculation. The population density. density will turn up in the more advanced models that we in in the in the agent based models where we can put in densities. These the density turns up indirectly in the sort of models that I was describing. The density is is sort of reflects the ease with which one person who is infected passes on the infection to someone who is susceptible. So that tunes this beta and the gamma parameters that I wrote down earlier. Exactly how it tunes is the subject of a whole different calculation. But effectively, you can put in density into that. Those simple equations only worry about numbers and not about density. So the numbers do actually enter into that. About Ebola, I didn't quite get the question, but so can you just repeat that part again about the Ebola question? The uh, Ebola, Ebola boom is the fact that you get larger number of children being born after a very good question. I think it's very likely. Ebola that, boom. I think it's very likely that after after so many days of lockdown that there will be a consequence nine months later, eight months later as a result of that. Yeah. This is it's and known when, when, will... when New York when New York had a had a um, had a power failure for for forty eight hours. There was a distinct boom at the end of nine months, so I, I, I don't think that that would be very surprising in our context. We haven't estimated that. That might be interesting. We'll we'll we'll, we'll see that later. With, with probably within a few months, we'll see whether that made a difference. Okay, we're going to uh, travel from Kerala to a uh, uh, question from Calcutta. Shuchitana, Shuchitana, Chatty. Oh, uh, hello, Gautam. This is Shuchita. Uh, wonderful talk. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you very clearly. Yeah, great. So the question is that suppose you want to model this uh, non-clinical intervention. I'm mean, locked down, I can understand, but suppose usage of mask. Yeah. Did you finish? I sort of lost you in between. I think I was muted okay. by the host. Yeah, no, I, so, got, I, I got you up to mask. And, and yes, and didn't hear what so how do you put that in your, do you put that <clears> in your modeling? And if, if you do, then how do you put that in your modeling? We don't, again, all of this is very indirectly in the modeling. We have one parameter, beta parameter that enters. There are beta, there are quantities called C in the models. Each of these in modeling terms can be used to represent the, in a somewhat indirect way. You can say that wearing a mask decreases the, the contact probability between individuals in the infected compartment and the... So you put some number like this? You can. So you, so, you, so you can estimate that. You can try and translate those estimates. You can benchmark those estimates by what is known from the data. Okay, thank you. Twenty percent increase in mask wearing leads to a decrease in R not by such and such. And some of these I numbers see. are known for not for Indian population but for foreign population. So you can put that analysis in. Thank you. Quite tired with questions, but I'm going to ask the last question. Uh -huh. a, a simple question. I mean, the I can see in your curve, which is goes up and down. I can understand why the why the uh, infection goes up exponentially. Why does it come down? Ah, very good question. <clears throat> you, you, you might have thought that the, the reason might be there are not enough people, that susceptibles go down. The answer is, and it's, a re, it's an interesting thing, that it's just much more unlikely to find yourself in a position where you can transfer the infection to a susceptible person than to, than to anyone else. So it's, it's a depletion of susceptibles that is largely responsible for this. But the susceptibles don't have to go to zero. Right, so this is not this is related to herd immunity, but 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 not you don't need to have herd immunity to even go, uh, go into the decreasing phase. You don't need to have herd immunity to go into the decreasing phase. Yeah, herd immunity sort of is, is used a little badly in, in the country. Herd immunity is technically immunity derived from vaccination, but so there's a very precise point that says if you vaccinate this much of the population, given a certain reproductive ratio, that effectively protects everybody in the population, even those who have not been vaccinated. So it's been sort of misused here for various reasons that, that are not, not very clear, but it's uh, much of, you know, much of the earlier discussion around herd immunity really used it in the wrong way, but this is the right way to think about it. And it's usually agreed that herd immunity through infection is a bad idea. Thanks very much. And uh, uh, I, I hope everybody will join me in, in applauding Gautam at the end. I mean, we have an applaud button in the reactions, but thank you very much. It was an absolutely fantastic talk. Thank you. Thank so you, Gautam. And anyway, fun. soon. Great fun to be here. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Gautam. Thank you. Bye. Bye.